What's going on, Flight Sim Crew? It's your pilot in command, Ryan, and just want to do a little quick flight, um, you know, just because. <laughs> and uh, this flight, I'm going to be taking off from Wilmington International Airport, and we're going to head over to a very small airport. Let's see if it shows up. Yep, um, OAN. Let me look up at that airport real quick. Yeah, not even in four flight. So hey, but I did check the um, I checked the runway length, and the runway length is twice the length of what the Cessna 172 needs for um, an ex for uh, uh, landing with a he healthy uh, safety margin. So. Should be good to go. And without further ado, um, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to assume that I've completed my pre flight and everything checked out. So, just a couple things here. We've got Master on, Avionics on, my Magneto set to both. I've got my beacon. Honestly, um, because it's night, I'm going to throw my navs and my landing and taxi lights on. I'm going to hold off on my strobe lights because on the ground, those strobes can really mess up another pilot's um, night vision. So we don't typically get those strobes going until we're up in the air so that we have that increased visibility when we're airborne. Uh, only exception to that is is that um, running the strobes during the, the daytime doesn't have that negative effect because you're not really dealing with people whose eyes have adjusted to night. And if it if I'm flying in the traffic pattern and it seems a bit hazy or anything, you know, like that, I will definitely run my strobes just because at the end of the day, you know, it's all about see and avoid. And if I can make myself a little more visible to any other pilots flying out there around me, then I am more than happy to do that. All right. So. Good, 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 good. All right, flight computer is set, and the Garmin is set. Let's see if towers clear us to take off. Oh, there we go. Uh, Wilmington Ground Cessna 733 Uniform Fox Trot. Um, crest taxi for takeoff. Good. Uh, taxi hold short. Okay, okay. And then for takeoff runway 24. All right, so we have already gotten our clearance. And I'm sorry for the background noise. That's just me getting up on my controls. And let's see if I can move this microphone a little bit closer so that you guys can hear me a little bit better. But. We are ready for takeoff. So, I am um, parking brakes off. Flaps are um, in the up position, which is what we want for this particular type of takeoff. We've got plenty of runway, so now we're going to smoothly apply the throttle. As you can see, that RPM gauge is coming up, giving a little bit of right rudder to keep us on center line. You can see engine instruments are in green. And we now see airspeed is alive. And we are waiting for our rotation, which is up right around 55. And there it is. And now we're going to climb out. And we're climbing out at VX. Um, I'm going to climb out at, uh, at VY. So I'm going to build up my airspeed a little bit so I can get to 73. And once I have 73. There's a little bit of wind up here. That's why I'm kind of getting blown backwards and forwards. All right, so I've passed 73, so now I can trade off some of my airspeed for um, a better rate of climb. And, oh yeah, let me put my strobes on now. Um, you can see, well, can't really see my airplane, but there I am. So, we are on our takeoff climb. We want to climb up to 600. And we're going to assume that Tower gave us um, the you know clearance for 
uh, left traffic um, and then departure and proceed on course. So I keep the climb going all the way up past pattern altitude, which is a thousand, which we're coming up on right now. And let's see. It would be nice if that showed me where my airplane was. Whoops, that's what happens. I'm not actually stalling, that's fine. But I gotta remember that when I use my mouse, it takes away my my um, yoke controls. That's uh, less than desirable, to say the least. Uh, yeah, now we've got good airspeed. We're up at uh, 1,200. Well, let's see, we are heading westbound so we would probably want to climb to flight level 3500 for a uh, VFR flight. Speaking of VFR, so as you can tell it's night and that is not VFR. But I just think that there's nothing more beautiful than I mean, look at this. Look at this. There's nothing more beautiful than a runway lit up at night and that is just a sight to behold all right with that out of the way let's uh modify my weather conditions and let's do there we go that looks nice all right, all right i'm gonna keep my climb going so i'm at 2000 now and i'm turning to my heading that will take me to the airport that I'm going to and maintaining that climb. So I'm going to zoom out here a little bit so you can kind of get a good feel. Now as we get up to around 3000 it's going to be worth it for me to pull back a little bit on the mixture control just so that I'm not putting too much fuel to a limited air mixture that can cause fouling of the um, the plugs and magnetos and could may cause the engine to run a bit rough worst case scenario could cause the engine to um, not be able to to fire its spark plugs and combust so always want to be cognizant of that because nobody wants a in-flight engine failure even though we do practice for those and as we are now climbing up to 3,000 feet, um, I construct to begin my leveling off procedure, which is pretty simple. We're going to slowly put the nose down. We're going to pull back on the throttle. And we're really aiming for about 2,200 RPMs. So, um, let's see if I can show you that RPM gauge there. There's my RPM gauge. And as you can see, engine instruments in grain. Okay, let me get back out of here where I can control my airplane again. All right, so. Let's see if I can contact Cherry Point Approach. Let's see. Um, I'm heading to Lake Waccamaw. All right, they don't have much in the way of services, so no big deal. I am now at my desired altitude, so I'm going to back off a little bit more on the throttle. And we are now to the cruise portion of the flight, so this would be a time where if I was in an airline, I would come on and say uh, thank you for flying I don't know, Ryanair uh, this is your captain speaking and uh, we are currently at uh, 3,500 feet uh, ground speed is about 97 and uh, miles per hour and we're expecting uh, you know, no, no turbulence and a very smooth uh, flight here as we head to Lake Waccamaw. Folks, thank you so much for choosing Ryanair, and uh, I will do my best to give a landing that is Delta worthy and not Ryanair worthy. Sorry, folks, for Ryanair. You guys are the 
blunt of pretty much every joke in the industry, but <laughs> work on that. <laughs> so, um, all right. And since we're in the cruise phase, we do still want to check, make sure that oil pressure is good, oil temperature is good, my vacuum gauge is good. Um, I've got half a tank of, well, half half tanks of gas should be sufficient and RPMs is good so everything here is looking pretty nice uh, as you can see I'm a little, about f a little bit over my desired um, desired altitude so I'm gonna just do a small descent All right, so what we just just did there was we um, ask for something called flight following. So we give you a little bit of what those radio calls would have sounded like. I would first cold, cold call. So I would cue my mic and I would say Skyhawk 733 uniform Foxtrot. And that would just wait. And that's because they can be very busy. Uh, then they would come back over and they would say, Uniform Foxtrot, you know, go ahead. And I would say, um, Skyhawk 733 Uniform Foxtrot uh, is flight level 3,200, climbing to 3,500, flying to um, OAN or Oscar Alpha November uh, to perform a touch and go, and then returning back to Wilmington, requesting flight following. And a few moments later, they would come back and they would say, Squawk 5522. And I would squawk that transponder code. And then I would be on their radar and they would provide um, basically like uh, just, it's, it's an extra layer of protection. So they're, they're going to see every airplane all over the place. And obviously my aircraft does not have its own onboard radar system which a lot of the high-end ones do so they act as a second set of eyes so that if an airplane does come within the vicinity of me they'll let me know they'll ask if i have the traffic in sight and um yeah so it's just it's meant to maintain you know safety in the air it is not required so i could stick with vfr uh, only and I would squawk one two zero zero and I don't have to speak the tower. It's um you know just a, a nice nice thing to have and a good rule of thumb is to use flight following if you can because why not you know um, another big advantage is is that if I was flying to an area that had a military operations area an MOA. Um, or if I was flying to an area that had um, a res restricted uh, airspace, I could ask the tower if those areas, the MOA or the restricted airspace, is currently in use or is active. And if they come back and they say, no, it's inactive and it's done for the day, then, that, then I'm clear to fly through that airspace. Where, you know, if they say, no, oh, we got a bunch of Harriers doing Harrier things, then I would stay out of that area. For any of those interested in um, learning and becoming a student pilot, I actually recently got a wonderful app. It is called Live ATC. Uh, it's on on iPhone. I would expect it is for uh, Android as well. It does have a cost to purchase the app, but there are no in-app purchases, so it's just a one-time you know fee. But the advantage is is that it you can pick tons of different towers. So I, I just went right to to North Carolina, and um, I was able to do Cherry Point, which is the big one that we talked to out of New Bern, and also Wilmington's. Uh, was in there so um, it's helpful if you're just driving in the car and don't feel like listening to music or a podcast uh, I just throw this app on and I listen to radio chatter and it helps me to 
understand what normal communications are like between other pilots, but it also allows me to kind of tune my ear so that when when I'm up there, you know, I, I'm a little better prepared for what they may ask or what deviations, I shouldn't say deviations, detours that I should, that they may want me to make. And um, just all in all, it's kind of, if you're a computer nerd, it's totally worth it. Uh, <laughs> on my drive back from, I think I was in New Bern and I was listening to it and I, I sent a, I sent it over to my instructor, and right at the time I was sending the message to my instructor, uh, the radio call came over, and it was one one of the flight school's airplanes, 733 Hotel Hotel, which was the plane I originally soloed on, and um, it was you know being released from flight following, and you know told to just head on Newburn, but I, you know that was just kind of neat because I was like, ah, that's either another student or an instructor flying in a plane that I've flown many times. So, um, by the way, um, just just to throw this out there, there is no such thing as privacy um, in aviation. So uh, every radio call that is made, uh, somebody is probably recording it. Uh, there are actually YouTube channels that pride themselves on, we'll say, funny, awkward, or unusual. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start my descent here. Um, Actually, you know what? Nah, it's a little too early to start my descent. Um, I mean, their entire channel is just based off of humorous um, communications between tower and uh, various aircraft. Uh, and uh, I hope I never end up on one of those channels. But uh, there have been a few, uh, I'll say, high famous um, celebrities who have made some dumb aeronautical mistakes. I won't name the particular person, but, you know, if you did some Googling about, uh, you know, just someone landing on a taxiway instead of the runway, um, you can actually find the recording of the movie star and his, him realizing his uh, dumb mistake and uh, with, uh, with his head held low, the tower gave him the uh, number to call for uh, filing a what's called pi pilot deviation report. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. And earlier when I mentioned I didn't want to use the word deviation, that's because deviation has a very particular meaning in aviation. Uh, a pilot deviation basically means tower said do something, pilot did whatever pilot wanted to do, which was not permitted. So a pilot deviation is bad and usually requires a uh, an FAA report. Let's see if we can find my airport. All right, I see nothing. Okay. All right, but you know what? I can probably go ahead and see if I can get weather information for them. Let's cancel flight following and nearest airport list. OAN. Oh, all right. So this particular airport, because of how small it is, it does not have a um, weather service, meaning that um, I can't check and see what the local weather is and if the winds were different. I have no way of knowing that. Most airports will have um, it's called ASOS and. Um, They'll have an automated weather system which tells you the weather, and you always check that first, well before you get within range of the airport. So, let's see. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to check the weather, the um, ground level. Okay, so wind is blowing from 271. So, we want to land into the wind, so that's going to be runway three. Ah, there we are. That's that's actually very helpful. Uh, eventually, I'm going to have to turn that feature off, but um, it is beneficial right now for me to locate an airport which I've never been to. 
As you can see, we have descended down. We're at 1,900. Pattern altitude most likely is going to be at 1,000. You can see my airspeed has now gone down to between 70 and 80 knots. That's fine. We want it to, to be kind of closer to that white arc so that as I need to, I can put my flaps on. Now, I think I've mentioned this before, Microsoft is very particular. They want me to go way too slow through the entire traffic pattern. And that is just not what I've ever been told by multiple instructors. So I will maintain my current speed and on the downwind leg. And then when I go to turn base, that's when I'm gonna start putting flaps in and I'll get my speed down probably between um, say 65 and 75. And then when I start to come in the final, um, my airspeed needs to be between 65 and 70. And like I said, I guess the programmers at Microsoft didn't get that memo because they want you to be at like 65 the entire time. And there's something that, uh, so a saying between pilots is that you don't want to find yourself low and slow. So low meaning close to the ground, slow meaning you ain't flying that fast. And that is a recipe to uh, have a stall. And the lower you are, even though we do practice a lot of stalls, um, but the lower you are, the less wiggle room you have to recover from that stall before you make an, an abrupt um, encounter with trees or with the ground. So generally a power off stall, uh, or excuse me, a slow flight uh, power off stall, a lot easier to recover from. Uh, you don't get much in the way of rate of climb, but you can get your airplane to stop descending and to start gaining some altitude pretty quickly. On the flip side of that, a uh, um, on on the flip side of that, a power on stall, which is meant to kind of simulate a stall during takeoff. If somebody just tries to go, you know, rocket ship, does that. Yeah, which you don't do that as you heard my stall horn just went off. Um, then those stalls are much trickier because it's a game of physics. You have to just hold the nose down until you build up enough airspeed that you can level out. And where I probably won't lose more than 100 to 200 feet during a power off stall, I would say uh, realistically, and I'm, I'm going to give myself a margin of of um, safety here, but I would say it's uh, it's four to five hundred feet for me to recover from a um, power on stall. So, you know, if you're four hundred feet off the ground and you have a power power um, on stall, uh, things aren't looking good for you. Yeah, you better hope your airplane was uh retro equipped with uh, afterburners so that you can fire those bad boys up <laughs> um, or maybe strap some solid rocket boosters to the side like they do with the uh, C-130 alright so we are now entering downwind you can see that my speed is 65 I'm going to add a little bit of juice Microsoft likes that but I don't like that that's a little too slow for me We can go back to being mixture rich. Um, we don't have carb heat on this airplane. My flaps are down. My throttle, good. Uh, okay, everything else is looking good. So we have completed our descent checklist and we are now getting into our descent uh, for landing checklist. If I'm able to, as I'm editing this video, I'll I'll scan my flight school's um I'll scan my flight school's checklist, the ones that they have us trained by, because it is a little different than what Microsoft Flight Simulator puts in in their game, and um, I mean obviously it's a flight school. It's graduated tons of pilots, so I tend to trust uh, what they say is the important 
important parts of the checklist a lot more than I trust old Microsoft, which may just be, you know, kind of doing a little bit of a one acme when it comes to some of these some of these checklists and some of these requirements. Alright, so we are about halfway through down when leg I am my airspeed is uh, 60 to 70. Um, still wants me to slow down. I'll retard my throttle just a little bit, but I still have a couple more notches of flaps, so I can allow the, the aircraft to slow down more if I feel like I need it. Recently here, though, as I've been doing a lot of solo landings, I'm really finding that fl um, flaps one, notch one and notch two are sufficient. Um, if I'm kind of a little bit higher than I'd like to be, then yeah, I'll throw in flaps three because it, it allows me to come down a little bit steeper. But flaps four is just like overkill. Uh, I don't know why anyone would feel the need to use uh, full flaps on a Cessna 172. Um, it, I'm sure there might be some scenarios and maybe it's some pilot's flying style, but it is excessive to me and the way I fly the airplane. Now, um, as I am currently in, uh, in a configuration known as slow flight, slow flight has slightly different rules in terms of how the aircraft performs. So normally your airspeed um, is based off of your throttle and your altitude, whether you're climbing or falling, is based off of where you put the nose. The hold on, base leg. Um, in a slow flight configuration, because you have those flaps, which induce a lot of drag, but they also give you more lift, uh, but they also limit how fast that the aircraft can go, the rules change a little bit. So in slow flight configuration, nose down, builds airspeed, so you actually see my airspeed going up, whereas nose up, I'm not stalling, but there we go, all right. So where you put your nose in slow flight is what determines your airspeed. Where you put your throttle determines your rate of climb or your rate of descent. So it gets a little different than just normal straight and level flight, which is why if you ever go to a flight school, you will spend many, many a lesson doing straight and level flight before you start doing this type of stuff because it's just different. Um, I was lucky when basically my first day you know, back to the flight school after not flying for 20 years, my instructor felt that I was competent and he was like, I right, just do everything. <laughs> so, okay, um, you sure about that? But I, I did appreciate the vote of confidence. See, am I coming up on final now? I think I am. Yeah. And these radio calls, and I, I have it muted so you guys don't have to hear it, but all, all these radio calls are, are what are known as vicinity calls. So um, there may be nobody flying in. Oh, this is going to be a grass field. Even better. I get to do my grass field landing. Um, but there may be no other traffic in this area. Uh, there is a Unicom frequency for this airport. And basically, we are um, just communicating so that if someone out there is thinking about taking off or if there's somebody that's coming, coming into this area, they are aware that I'm here and then where I am. So that's why I make these various calls. All right, so we are coming in on final. Now, this isn't a paved runway, so I don't quite have the... Um, I don't quite have the visual cues that I have. I have no center line. I have no thousand foot markers. I feel like I'm getting a little close to trees. I don't want to hit the tree. All right, there we go. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and kill the engine. I'm not stalling. All right, and then we're going to come down, and we... Yeah, I know. I want you to stall because I want you to get on the ground. 
All right. And then we dump the flaps. And that helps us to come to a stop on the grass field. All right. Now. Not bad. And we'll let's see. All right. So there's where the runway began. And it's about one quarter of the way. And I still got two quarters in front of me. So good old Ryan and his short field landings. Um, I'm still holding holding true to my reputation. Give me a postage stamp and I'll land on it. Don't don't tell my instructor that. I, I don't want him to think I'm actually going to try to land on a postage stamp. At least not until I get my license. Then then you can tell that. Not sure where my engine died. Alright, so we're going to announce taxing. And we're going to get off this run right. So this is the little weird glitch that I'm having to deal with occasionally. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and announce clear of runway. And folks, thank you so much for joining me for this quick video. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it. Maybe you learned something. Maybe you just dealt with me talking about aviation stuff for the duration of the flight, which hopefully made the flight go a little bit quicker. If you enjoy this um, content, feel free to check out my channel again. Everyone says subscribe, but you know the deal. Subscribe, don't subscribe, I don't care. And, um, you know, just I want people to just enjoy this content. Um, leave a comment if you really want to. You know, not many people leave comments, but uh, it is what it is. I don't really care. And uh, But, you know, give it a like if you like it. Dislike if you don't like it. Um, you know, it's... I appreciate that level of feedback just because, you know, it helps me to know if I'm making videos that are somewhat better or if I'm, you know, not doing as well as I would like to do. So, your feedback is appreciated in terms of me making better content, but you are under no obligation to do any of that stuff because I value your time. And with that being said, I'm going to go through my engine shutdown procedure, folks. Thank you for joining and we will see you all in the next one.